You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. This is episode 18 of season three, the Cody Bellinger press conference. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter and Instagram, and Fly the W on Facebook, or email us at fly the w670 at gmail.com. Crowley, happy uh, Wednesday. And uh, it's official, official, official now. Cody Bellinger is a Cub, at least for one more year at $30 million. And very interesting today, Cody Bellinger, Jed Hoyer, and Scott Boris all sitting shoulder to shoulder taking questions from the media. Dustin, I don't know if you saw my tweet on this at Crawley's Cubs, but to me, it was so funny to see like uh, Bellinger in the middle of Boris and Hoyer. It looked to me, it reminds me of like when you're with your mother-in-law and your mother at like some event with your kids, just kind of like in the middle of two people that kind of may not like each other too much. So, uh, you know, it, it was a fun press conference. Uh, I think that everybody... Again, it was awkward, you know, Boris. Well, you know, let's get into that. Let, let's get into this, Crowley. Let, let's get, I didn't think we were going to go here right away, but it, since we're here, let's, let's go here. Let's not, <laughs> let's not beat around the book. There, there's, why do you think he, I mean, I expected him to be in the room supporting Cody Bellinger, but I'm shocked that, that he was sitting up there. Why, why would the Cubs, why would Jed Hoyer, who didn't look real thrilled, by the way, um, not as thrilled as he usually does. I mean, he's usually in those situations, a real uh, great leader and great example for everybody, but he didn't look happy. Why in the world would they give him that platform? Uh, you know, it was, here's the thing is, is you have to deal with Scott Boris. That, that's just a fact. He has the best players under there. I bet he wanted to talk and honestly, probably to try to let him save face a little bit, Dustin, this is, he's the guy known for getting the big contract and I think he overshot what he thought Bellinger was worth. And so, you know what, you give him this little cookie and maybe, you know, in the future, you're trying to keep good relations going. And you could see that that's what they were kind of trying to do later on in the interview. There was kind of some talk about, you know, comments that Tom Ricketts made. And, you know, remember we talked about how there was kind of that awkwardness between that exchange. And so, right, right. he, you know, they, I think everyone's just trying to play nice with each other. And, and guess what? You want Pete Alonso next year? Guess who you're going to have to go through. You know, th those are the type of things. This guy ain't going anywhere. So I don't think it was a big, I think it was kind of just kind of giving him a bone, giving him a platform. I mean, again, I fully expected him to be there. I thought maybe he'd end up having one of those kind of on the side type of things. I was just surprised that he was sitting up there with them at that moment. That's all. Now, one guy that did look happy was Cody Bellinger, and he's excited. Here's what he had to say about finally signing with the Cubs. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, you know, just the constant support uh, from, from the teammates. Um, you know, obviously, everyone knew how great of a time I had last year and, uh, you know, how just a great, great clubhouse that we had and, um, you know, just the positive words that they were bringing this past, se or this past off season was just great to hear and, um, you know, obviously was super excited to get back here with them. You know, the, the, there's we we've talked about this how the Cubs players to a man were all at even PCA all asking for Cody back, and they got him and and you know just seeing him high five and being in the locker room before today, it just it he was going to be a void if he wasn't there. It would have you would have felt it this year and, and it would have been different. Yeah, he definitely the Cubs definitely need him and part of this why I think this was able to happen the way it did is because Cody wants to be here and his teammates clearly wanted him to be here. Now, this is where it gets fun, Dustin. Here's Jed Hoyer on the process, and when we're done with that, we'll listen to how Scott Boris saw the process. Here's what Jed had to say. Yeah, I mean, I think really with, with, with Scott and with me, I think you can take the conversation back to July. You know, I think we started the conversation on this in July. Um, I think Scott will attest, like my, my comments to him about Cody have never wavered at all. I've felt all along... You know, great fit for the team, um, great fit in the clubhouse. You know, love the person, the family, all those things. So that was that never wavered. I think that you know we probably talked more often than Scott would have liked. You know, but I feel like we, um, you know, I think I think with any negotiation, um, I think there's sometimes a mis you know misperception that we just fire offers back and forth to each other. I think there's a lot of talking about what each side wanted, and I think over the last kind of five to seven days before we got a deal done. I think we kind of um, targeted a deal that made sense for both sides. And um, at that point, we did start making offers and talking more often and get ser getting serious. But 
we had a lot of talks, and like I said, our our comments about Cody and our desire to bring him back never wavered. It was just a matter of you know, finding the right fit. Uh, you know, there, there, it's it's hard because you can't really see it because this is audio. But if you watch the um, if you watch the press conference, there was some funny moments, and one of them was Jed saying, "You know, probably talked to more than Scott wanted to. A lot of talking, but Jed wasn't budging." And it only was until this last week that they really kind of started. You know, I think when I think that Cody wanted this deal done. And so that's when they really started shooting off the numbers that uh, Jed Hoyer was more comfortable with instead of Scott Boris and his six years, eight years, $200 million. So this looks like it all just got done in the last week, Dustin. Yeah. And if you believe what Cody said, he said that he just really found out that it was moving as quickly as it was basically 24 hours before it was announced. So at some point, you know, either late Thursday or early Friday was when he felt like this was going to get done when it got done. Now, Scott Boris, this is his take on how everything went. When you when you represent a player of Cody's caliber and you're talking about an MVP talent um, who's had irregularity outside of consequences that are unrelated to him, like um, a 250-pound pitcher stepping on his ankle or a... Uh, a teammate rather aggressively in celebration <laughs> causing a, a an eventual surgery those are things that are not related to to Cody or his durability or what he does and and free agency is like a i don't know it's it's kind of like a turkey and a and a thermometer you kind of have to go in see what the temperature is evaluate it and Cody and I agreed that that we're going to look at this in a couple ways. We're going to have two positive outcomes for this process. And the one positive outcome we knew that, and, and Jed was very clear that they wanted to uh, contract with Cody and, and, and have him on the team. And our dynamic was to determine whether there was, uh, what, what it was on the other end with, with a contract of great length. And as we got through that process and looked to it, is that that's certainly where we let Jed know that on something like this, with this kind of structure, with this kind of flexibility, with these kinds of things, it's what we're looking for. And uh, and we had mutual agreement and understanding that this, this type of structure was agreeable to both of us. So, um, you know, teams, each team functions in their own way. Is that so I just listening to him, you know, I think that he, again, he thought that Turkey and the temperature, the thermometer, I think he misread it. He thought the market was going to be a little bit hotter and the Turkey wasn't that hot, but he did bring up Dustin. And I thought this was interesting. He brought up the injuries. Okay. So he, he brought up the injury to Enrique, uh, Kike Hernandez. If you remember, he high fied him too much in the playoffs that hurt his shoulder. But from what a lot of people think, it wasn't that as much as a matter of that there was a play um, where Boris brought about 215-pound pitcher stepping on his ankle. That yeah. was a play where Ramin Guadan from the A's, and it was the worst thing because it was like a 10-3 to Dodgers blowout of Oakland, and there was a, a chopper to first, and Guadin is, is, is a big pitcher. He's, he's heading towards first, and it's a close play, and he steps on Cody's ankle. And that left him with a fractured left fibula. So something within those injuries, I mean, we talked about this, Dustin. The reason that Cody didn't get the big money is because people want to see him do it two years in a row and hope that it's not just a fluke year before handing him a massive check. Right. And I understand that. And this is what the market provided. So that's what's going to happen. Right. But I can tell you that, like, again, looking at the visuals of it, you could totally see that Craig, uh, Scott Boris was not the confident, cocky, smirky swag. No, was... no. Good point. Good, good point. Good observation. <laughs> yeah. He looked like he had uh, eaten a little turkey or maybe a little crow. Maybe he had a little, uh, what is it? The uh, tryptophan? Is that is that the thing that's in the there... turkey that makes you want to take the nap after you eat it all while you're watching the Cowboys play? Look more like indigestion to me, but uh, who knows? But as, as we kind of go through here, um, you know, we're, we're talking about Cody's desire to return. This is what Cody had to say about that. Didn't hide the fact, uh, internally that I, I did want to come back here and, um, you know, I just, you know, loved Wrigley Field. I loved the fans. Um, me and my family enjoyed, you know, Chicago and, um, when it was, you know, coming towards the end and everything was kind of coming to light a little bit. And this was definitely something that, um, you know, 
definitely I wanted and um, both sides agreed on and I'm super happy that it worked out the way it did. Hoyer and if you remember Hoyer and uh, Tom Ricketts on the last game of the season, I think they both spoke to Marquis. Both of them talked about how Cody did enjoy his time here. Obviously, he enjoyed the locker room. His his teammates are ecstatic, and and talking about his wife and his family enjoying the city of Chicago. So, you know, I think that that ultimately, you know, when when he wasn't going to get that long term deal, and it was going to look like a short term deal, the Cubs were where he wanted to go. Yep, no doubt about it. He wants to be here. The Cubs wanted him. It it, it makes a lot of sense. And again, thirty million is nothing to sneeze at, right? He's getting no. paid. It's not like he's making 18 or 17. It's not a, I don't really consider this a, uh, to me, this isn't really a pillow contract. He's getting, he's getting the yearly wage that he was looking for. He's just not getting it over six, seven, eight years. Now, one thing that's going to pump Cub fans up is, is one of the, another reason why Cody wanted to come back to Chicago. Here's what he said. You know, once, um, we understood what was going on about it all. I was wanting to be here, and, um, you know, I did want to come back to this team, and I did want to, you know, do my best help. I mean, we were so close last year, like, you know, so close last year to, to becoming a playoff team, and um, that was a pretty important piece for me was to get back here, and I want to help bring the, this team to the playoffs, you know what I mean? So that's definitely what uh, that was a want and a need for me. I wanted to I wanted to try and do that. Now, fans are going to love that, but to me, that was really, like, it was a passionate moment for Cody. He really was talking about, like, being so close and wanting to kind of come back to that. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking that all in all, it, he's going to, you know, these this whole team, I don't think it's just Cody. They are kind of, I do think that they hold a little something that they felt that they should have been a playoff team next year. And to come one game short, I think that they're really going to want to fight back and, and show that they are a playoff team this year. Yeah, he wants to finish unfinished business. Guess what? I want him to finish unfinished business as well. And he's going to be a big reason if they're able to finish that business that they got started last season. No doubt about it. Now, we've talked, Dustin, about how PCA is probably going to be one of the guys most affected by the signing. And here's what Cody had to say about Pete Crow Armstrong. I love Pete. I think that he's an amazing kid. Um, And he's got such a bright future ahead of him. Um, He's an amazing talent. Um, you know, actually during this whole process, you know, we continued to chat just because, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I really love the kid. I respect, I respect him and and how he plays the game and everything. And so we've had a lot of open communication with each other and, um, it's nothing but love between us. And, um, you know, like I said, he's, he's an amazing talent and he's going to have a really, really long MLB career ahead of him. So, you know, it's just good because we do want uh, Cody to be a good mentor to PCA and kind of to help him out. And as I've mentioned many times, PCA is only 21. It's not like he's 26, 27. He's going to have a long career. This just takes some of the pressure off him. He doesn't have to be the offensive star to replace Cody's numbers. He can literally take his time and ease into it. and, And I have no doubt that he'll be on the big league club at some point in time this season. Okay, so a couple things there. At some point in time this season, Mm -hmm. that's what you just said. And also, so based on what was said, do you believe that he is going to um, be the starting center fielder now? I think Cody Bellinger, yeah. So he's your starting starting center fielder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's interesting, right? I mean, okay, so Shaw's who's playing first then, without a doubt. I would go. I mean, I think that's what we're going to see there. You see a lot of Michael Bush so far. He just came. I right. uh, had his first couple starts. We're, they're going to look at Matt Mervis. I think he's had uh, some good at bats. I've been watching him. He's had a really good eye, I think. And then Patrick Wisdom uh, against lefties. So I think those are their two of those three guys are going to be it. Wisdom and yeah. either Mervis or Bush. Well, we got to keep an eye on that. I'm not so sure I love the idea of. PCA going back to the minors and having Bellinger in center primarily, and then a hmm question mark over at first. Yeah, and 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 but Dustin, if there is a hmm question mark at first, and you see that, and PCA is tearing it up in Iowa, then you could easily put PCA back in center, and you can move uh, Bellinger to first, and then you can send one of the other guys down, whoever's up. No, I, I listen. I, I get it that you can make moves. I'm just curious how it's all going to shake out for opening day out in Texas. That's all. Now, this is another funny moment here. Uh, 
Scott Boris was asked if he had any more press conferences coming up. Scott, uh, do you have any more of these events scheduled in the next few days? (laughs) 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 So the reason everybody's laughing is because that was the only time that Boris directly looked Jed Hoyer in the eye. He actually looked around Cody, looked directly at Jed, like, hey, Jed, are we doing any one of these? Because, hey, those, you know, Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell are still out there, so... Hey man, you know what? If you're gonna if you're gonna hit that luxury tax, why not why not go for the whole enchilada, right? You could still yeah, be whole hungry. enchilada, right? Yeah, whole yeah. enchilada. Yeah. Right. Whole if they you know, I wouldn't mind it. So hey, let, let's get some more guys. I'm I'm not done. Um, but Jed, not our you, money, not our money. Go ahead. <laughs> Jed Jed did kind of have to say that the team was kind of done. Here's what he said. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that would be the expectation. Um, obviously, we're never gonna stop looking and so you know I, I never put a final you know final nail in, in that because i think that you know things come up all the time trades free agents but you know certainly we're it's the 28th of february um so yeah i, I think that's the expectation though i would never rule anything out is kind of how i would phrase it yeah now i'm telling you dustin and and if one of those guys blake snell or jordan montgomery would take a one-year pillow deal i would absolutely jump on that absolutely. i just yep. i just yep. don't see that happening though yeah. with i agree with you i don't see that happening that that i don't i don't see that and let but again here's the thing the cubs can go right up to the 11th hour on this so again absolutely. it's going to be another game of chicken and who's going to blink first no doubt about it, but I think with those guys, they're older, so it's like Cody Bellinger is still pretty young. Was he 27? You know what I mean? Well, he he's can, 28. He's 28. So 28. He's, yeah. he's younger so saying, than like, Snell. You gotta, right. Oh, absolutely. Younger than Snell, right? Younger than Montgomery. So, you know, those guys have to kind of get the longer deals. You don't want to waste years here. So that might affect their value. But, hey, you never know, Dustin. We, You know, you never know. And, and so – you know, Scott Boris was asked about, you know, some of these guys signing and Boris talked about how it does make a big deal and can completely change the makeup of a team. And and remember, I had Rowan on Kovac from Fox Sports talking about how the Cubs right, you know, back in when he wrote the article in late January, were the most disappointing offseason team. And Roman said, all it takes is one or two moves to completely flip an offseason. And that's what the Cubs did with this move. We went from feeling very unsure and not really happy with the off season to feeling a whole lot better. And so here's what Boris had to say about what his other clients can contribute. And this is frankly where baseball Analeg o- operates at its best. This is no different than right now is no different than the uh, trading deadline in, in July. I get to add players that can in one day change a locker room as we've seen happen today. You know, and when Cody Bellinger walks in, you watch the glow of a franchise and, and the opportunities of a franchise completely change. And that that impact, I think, is what uh, is something that is known to the to the staff and the people that study it, and know it. And there's more certainty to their decisions when you when you make decisions at, at a later time in free agency. So I don't look at it as a negative. I just look at it as as a element of how markets develop in particular situations and where we happen to be in one at this time. You know, it really did change the whole outlook for me, Dustin, of this season. I was not comfortable going in without Cody Bellinger or someone that could replace his offensive value to the Cubs. Now, after all of this, I feel a ton better. Oh, gosh, so much better. I mean, you know, as we talked about the angst, the hand wringing, the emotions, the roller coaster, trying to figure out where the pop was going to come from, who was going to take on the extra responsibility for hitting those home runs, right? We said on a previous episode that um, Swanson, Hap, and Suzuki all were going to have to have a minimum of 25 home runs a piece, bare minimum for this thing to work out. And now maybe they don't have to have 25. Sure, I'd like each of them to have 25, but maybe now they don't have to each have 25. Absolutely. And so one more note, the Cubs did make a procedural move. They traded lefty Bailey Horn, who I I, I thought was, you know, Cubs need lefties, but they traded him back to the White Sox. So the Cubs got Bailey from the White Sox in the Ryan Tapera deal. And the Cubs get back 23 year old right-handed pitcher, Matt Thompson. So Matt's not on the 40 man roster that frees up a spot. Cody Bellinger takes it and wishing Bailey Horn, nothing but the best except against when he faces the Chicago Cubs. Absolutely. Right.
This is episode 18 of season three of the Fly the W670 podcast, the Cody Bellinger press conference. Don't forget to listen. Don't forget to download, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast, and don't forget to leave us one of those five-star reviews. In this segment, we are going to talk to Gordon Whitmeyer. We're going to begin our tour of the NL Central as Crawley interviews Gordon Whitmeyer, former Cubs scribe, member of the uh, Mully and Haw team he used to cover the cubs and be a regular with us he's now the beat writer for the cincinnati reds and with the inquirer and uh he can now give our listeners some insight into the moves the reds have made in the offseason and their push for the national league central title joining me now on the fly the w podcast glad to have on our old friend gordon wittenmeyer you remember him from being the cubs beat writer with the chicago sun times now covering the Cincinnati Reds for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Gordon, how are you? I'm doing great, Crawley. How are you, man? I'm excited. I'm uh, about two and a half weeks away from heading out to Mesa. So you know that's always a good time. Beautiful. Yeah, the weather out here is great. It's way up in, uh, in the mid-upper 80s now. Hitting a mid, mid-spring stride. Uh, now, Gordon, you know, you're the first. Yes, you're doing I, the same I, thing, though, right? Oh yeah. We, well, it was 70 yesterday and it's 30 degrees today. So we're getting those fake uh, springtime. Yeah. My wife was telling me there was a day like that. There was a two day period like that a a few days back too. Right. Yep. So we're going like seventies to thirties every other day. So hopefully we can start bringing some sun back here. Now, Gordon, you know, we're going to be covering all the different NL central teams, but I had to start off with you first because the Cubs just played the Reds on Tuesday it was a 6-6 tie, although it didn't seem like it would end up that way from the way it was going. And then they play next week on May 7th. And so I, I, you know, Gordon, I was looking here and when I looked at the central standings last year, this is how close it came between the Cubs and the Reds. The Cubs finished with a record of 83 and 79, nine games behind the Brewers. But the Reds were right there at 82 and 80, just a one game difference separating those two teams. Yeah. I mean, it really was an exciting year for Reds fans because of all the young talent that started coming up. Yeah. Not only that, but, you know, the Cubs were just one game back of the playoffs with Arizona being the last team in. And the Reds had the tiebreaker against both those teams. That's how close the Reds were. uh, If they'd been able to just, win two games anywhere. I mean, they blew a nine, nothing lead against the pirates uh, last week or two of the season. There would have been one of them, but anyway, uh, uh, they did it. Go back and look at the reds pitching stats last year. They had uh hundred green, their opening day starter and Nick Lodolo, their, their second game starter spent a combined seven months on the IL last year. And they had, I believe it's the third worst rotation ERA in the game last year. All the other teams in the bottom five were bottom feeders because that, we know, I mean, that's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work. And these guys somehow with all the youth infusion starting in May and definitely in June started winning games. They had no business winning and their bullpen, which was literally every guy in that bullpen was a waiver claim or a rule five guy or a guy that was exposed in the rule five draft. Guys literally that other teams didn't want or gave up on. That collective group was just a workhorse until finally getting gassed down the stretch. But they kept that team in it. Go look at their bullpen war and innings workload, and it's right up near the top of the game. All these crazy long shot weird things happened last year that put them in position to try to make the playoffs. Now, one thing to point out, right, is that well, how do you replicate that? Like, like you'll be lucky. Like they could have. I've told people this: they, they've added good players. They're a little bit better. You know, that the, the, everybody's experienced now. They've got a little more experience. They got high end talent. They got a tremendously high ceiling. But who knows what the floor is? I've told people this team could win ninety five games or seventy five games. Hmm. That's how volatile it is. Yeah. And like, you know, like you said, they had that youth infusion in May and June from June 10th to the June 23rd. And we talked about this last season, Gordon starts with the Cubs. The Reds went on a 12 game winning streak, which was their third best in franchise history, which, you know, when you think about the Reds and the big red machine and some of those great teams they had, I mean, that's just almost improbable. 
The big red machine never did that. No. You had to go back to Gus friggin' Bell in like <laughs> 1957 or something like that when they when they had last done that. I mean, but here's the thing, Gordon, you know, we're going to talk about this later. You had a great article about the Reds and the Cubs rivalry and Bellinger coming back. But I went and I took a look at this. In the NL Central, the Reds lost the series to the Pirates five games to eight. When you talk about those two games, boy, you really can't be losing that many to the Pirates. You lost right. the series to the Cardinals six games to seven. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Did you say you lost? Ah, the Reds lost. I didn't lose any damn games to anybody. <laughs> The, the Reds lost to the Cardinals six games to seven. That was the Friday they lost to the Cardinals. That knocked them out of the postseason. Yeah. And the Reds went three and ten against the Brewers, the only team in the NL Central that the Reds were able to win a series season series season series was against the Cubs. They took uh, the they took seven out of uh, thirteen games. They also had a losing record at home by a lot. They would have been a rare team to make the playoffs with a losing record at home had they gotten in. A lot of weird, weird things. Um, it, it, but it was a different team after I think Matt McClain broke in on May 14th or 15th. It was a different team after that. The other thing is when they opened the season coming off of a hundred loss year last year, they didn't they didn't add players thinking they were going to make the playoffs. They just kind of filled gaps and and went into the season knowing that at some point some of these young guys would come through and they would hope to see some player development in the big leagues instead you know and well and they opened up the season terrible they opened up seven and 15 the pitching was terrible the the defense was even worse and then matt mcclain shows up and all of a sudden they get better defensively and they get a little bit faster and then ellie de la cruz shows up and then andrew abbott shows up andrew abbott goes on a 10 start tear which saves sort of saves the pitching in the middle of the season. And you could see where these young guys made that team better and why they felt it was worth investing in the team in the off season. They've spent $108 million, most of it on pitching to sort of create a floor, a solid floor to compete. And then they've got, and then they've got this, again, this, the ceiling with all this uh, high end, talent that may or may not hit this year right right so when when you talk about the 2024 reds this is going to be weird for me because in the first time for as long as i can remember joey Votto, oh gordon you guys couldn't find a spot for him i mean he's he's sad he's in a car wash he's there you go with you guys NHL again, hockey games <laughs> and i'll tell you this is it, no matter what joey Votto's numbers were god did that guy love hitting at wrigley field oh my god even at the end even at almost 40 years old and and he last year he comes back from 10 months on the IL with that shoulder injury and surgery hits a home run in his first first uh, game back uh, hits a home run on his 40th birthday hits like has this uncanny knack for for when this moment's big or when people are all paying attention cuz it's a, a spotlight time on the calendar boom he hits a home run or he has the the big game winning hit it it was uh, and plus he's just a funny character. I mean, he's just an interesting <laughs> character in the game. Um, yeah, they, they, they just, what it boiled down to honestly was, uh, it wasn't money. You know, it's easy to think that it's money with them. They, they bought out a $20 million option for $7 million. It's a $13 million difference, but their payroll was so low. It was inconsequential. That wasn't the issue. The issue was you bring in Joey Votto back who wants to play and who wasn't really all that thrilled with sitting the bench uh, in a couple of really important games down the stretch. And you've got all these young guys who you have big plans for in 2024. Where are you going to play them? And, if, and even if you come up with a formula that means he gets 250 to 400 at-bats, is he going to be happy with that? You know, kind of rotating through the DH spot. Is it coming off the bench? Is, you know, and... Are you, is that the best way to use a roster spot? Right, right. It, it's time, but man, he is just such an institution in Cincinnati. But oh, I totally agree. I mean, you know, I, I thought I thought they should bring him back just for that. I mean, you got this opportunity for a guy to finish his career in Cincinnati, just one more year. He was a huge influence with all these young guys. Find a way to make it work. I was right. advocating for that. I thought that made a lot of sense. But at the end of the day. Baseball decisions, I guess. Yeah. 
Speaking of baseball decisions, Nick Senzel gone, Ben Lively gone, right-handed pitcher. But like you were mentioning earlier, the Reds spent $108 million. Uh, Jaime Candelario, who Cub fans, again, he came through the Cubs system and then came back last year, injured back injury for uh, the Cubs. So that was kind of, didn't get to see the best of him. You mentioned Frankie Montes, and, and he looks like he's doing really well this spring. Emilio Pagan, Nick Martinez. So definitely loading up on the arms here. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, when if everybody's healthy, so they got like seven guys uh, going for the five rotation spots. Um, if everybody's healthy, four would you'd think four would be locked in for sure, and that would be Hunter Green, Lodolo, Ashcraft, and Frankie Montas. We know what he's been when he's been healthy. He was the pitcher everybody wanted from Oakland for two years. Uh, he was a near miss all-star a couple times once, once cause he got popped for PEDs. Right. I mean, he was, he was on his right. way to an all-star appearance that year, but this guy uh, was a rising star in the game until that shoulder injury that cropped up right before he got traded to the Yankees in 2022. He's healthy. Now he came to camp this year as a, a, in his throwing progression ahead of everybody in camp and his stuff's looked electric. You saw it. Uh, I, I, did you watch that game the other day? Yes, sir. Did you see him uh, on the, the two strikeouts, both looking, one spot in a breaking ball and one 96 miles an hour? Yeah, he um, looked, he looked, the Cubs couldn't do anything. They couldn't get a, they couldn't buy a hit really. They had a, what, a walk in the fourth and it wasn't until PCA got that double in the seventh mm -hmm. that uh, they even got a hit off anyone. My, my thinking on Frankie Montas is that you, like he was their last starting pitcher sign. He was their last, they, they actually brought a reliever in after that, Brent Suter, who's a nice addition to the bullpen. Um, but uh, Montas came in in January and or right around the first of January, they had already made the, the pitching acquisitions that they felt stabilized them. And with everybody coming back healthy, you had enough guys to think you could fill a rotation pretty competitively. He's the guy that's the upside gamble, right? He's got health issues. He may not hold up. That's the big question with him. But if he does, that's the guy with this track record. He's pitched in the playoffs, and he's got a high ceiling. If that guy's healthy for you all season, watch out. The Reds are at least going to be in it all year. I think he's the guy. Uh, all else being equal with everybody else, I think they'll. I think they got enough talent. They can. They can at least hang in there and be competitive and all that. But he's the guy that could make, that could be the difference in doing something special there. Um, you're just like, I think you go over to Milwaukee, uh, Chorio might be that guy, right? right. Um, it seems like everybody uh, might have a guy like that, you know, and um, is Imanaga that guy uh, for, for the, the Cubs? Is Bush? I mean, if Bush, does something significant this year with the opportunities going to be given? Um, uh, you know, belly is the obvious one, right? Right. Suzuki, Suzuki for a whole season. I don't know if he's I, performs for a whole season. I've been saying, say as the guy for me that I feel is going to have a breakout year this year. I think this is, you know, first camp, hopefully healthy all camp. I think I'm hoping he comes out and has a great season. Having Imanaga in the clubhouse with him, I think kind of just might loosen him up a little bit, you know, and make him feel a little bit better. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But as far as the Reds are concerned, you know, up the middle, no question. Matt McLean, you mentioned him, what he, what a difference he made. And Ellie De La Cruz, you know, he's just a really electric player. But the question for me, Gordon, is third base. And 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 so it's kind of like you got this Noel V. Marte, Spencer Steer, Christian Carnacion Strand. I mean, and, and you re-signed Jonathan India. Where, where are these guys all playing? Yeah, right. You're talking about, wait a minute, your concern in Chicago's third base, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, why, why didn't, why didn't your boys talk to uh, Jamer? I don't know. You know, I mean, he was here and, and I, I heard right away, just right even from the end of the season that they weren't going to go with him. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, I think that, you know, it, it was definitely an interesting, you know, cause like I said, he came, he had the back injury, but when he was healthy, he looked really good for the Cubs for the two, two and a half weeks we had him healthy. The Cubs had him healthy. So yeah, I was in I was in Chicago with the Reds when the, he came over. The the first two, three days, he looked like Babe Ruth. Right. So what do you guys think you're gonna do there for third? Who do you think's gonna get the, the glut of the starts in Cincinnati? 
Well, if, if he's healthy and he gets off the kind of start they, they hope and expect, it would be Noelvi Marte, who, by the way, broke in last year, but he's the one guy from that group that still maintains rookie status. He's got his eye on rookie of the year. That's going to be a tough – I mean, you got Yamamoto uh, <laughs> as, a, as a rookie, and, and then, you know, Imanaga too, and Chorio's uh, supposed to be a stud. So – who knows, but uh, he's got some experience and he's got a power speed mix and he's a nice looking player. He hit 300 uh, in the, in the, uh, in his what six weeks in the big leagues last year, probably him steer is going to be an outfielder. They've already moved him. He's going to be a full-time outfielder and India has been taking reps in the outfield too. Um, if he plays, it'll be at, if he plays in the infield, it'll be at second base and maybe a rotation involving first base. But they're going to try to get him a lot of at-bats in the outfield. So De, De La Cruz right now is your shortstop. McLean's your second baseman. And uh, Christian Encarnacion Strand is going to get some first base time. And then Jamer just kind of floats, right? He could be the opening day third baseman. Could be the opening day first baseman. Could be the DH. You know, so they're, last year when they had for about a minute, when everybody was healthy and all those young guys were up at one time, uh, David Bell didn't know if he had in, in their mind, he had 10 starters basically, or nine, nine starters for eight positions. So what he did was he came up with a nine man rotation essentially for the eight spots. And, you know, the catcher and center field were a little more stable, but essentially everybody was going to get a day off every seven to 10 days. And they had so many guys that could play infield outfield combinations that uh, he thought he had a way that it was going to work. And then somebody got hurt and then somebody else got hurt. And so that plan didn't last very long. I suspect that in that that's kind of the fallback position here, but I also think that it's baseball and things will take care of itself. Right. Right. And when, when you talk about the pitch and you mentioned Frankie Montas, but the question is going to be health with Hunter green, Graham Ashcraft, uh, Nick Lodolo, and, you know, Andrew Abbott, I thought had, you know, was really underrated when it comes to that group. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if everybody's healthy for the Reds, that could be a really dangerous rotation. I, I will tell you the guy that you didn't even mention is I, I think that by definition is almost makes him more underrated is Brandon Williamson, the left-hander who came up in May, middle of May, um, didn't really look great. It, he was an emergency call up because so many guys were hurt and he, and they had to keep running him out there. By the end of the season, he was – when Graham Ashcraft finished on the IL, Brandon Williamson was probably their best starter for the last th maybe three weeks of the season, and he just kept getting better. Andrew Abbott came up and for 10 starts was just lights out, but he pitched a lot, and, and, and he hit that sort of uh, – uh, I was going to say rookie wall, but really, I mean, he just – whether – he, he pitched, he threw more innings than he had anywhere, even, even in college and the pros combined his first year. And he's only shoot. I think he had only been, you know, like two professional seasons or something at that point. So he hit a wall and they kept running him out there every fifth day and he gave him what they had, but you know, two, you know, two innings, two real good innings, falter in the third or fourth, try to get through the fifth. It was that kind of thing every time out, but he looks better now. And with that experience, he says he's he's ready to to be have more stamina through the season. We'll see, but those are the guys at the end, right? So if everybody's right. healthy, L Lodolo might be the best of all of them, and he missed almost the entire season with a stress fracture in his leg, and they're taking him real slow to make sure that he builds up without aggravating anything. Uh, who knows, man? Who knows? But there's talent there. That's the thing. They got a ton of talent. Well, I'm, I'm going to go into one of your favorite things here, Gordon. I'm going to go into the Pagoda projections here. Oh, good Lord. And then when I look at the Pagoda projections, they got the uh, AARP St. Louis Cardinals winning the division with Chicago at 81 wins, Milwaukee at 79, and Cincinnati at 78. So, again, three games, you know, separating Cincinnati from Chicago from, you know, second to fourth. They got yeah. them close, which I think we agree with. But you and I were talking earlier – I think we both agree that this division to me is going to come down to the Cubs and the Reds. I think they're going to be, that's going to be a dog fight. I totally, that, that was actually the word that Kyle Hendricks used yesterday. Um, yeah. I, I think you're a hundred percent right. I mean, look at hundred percent. Another Kyle Hendrick ism. <laughs> uh, so look at, 
the Cardinals, right? What they win last year? 71, 72 games? Yeah. That's a hell of a leap. I don't care what you added on that pitching staff. I mean, are you really that thrilled with Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn as 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 count on it, bankable every five day competitive starters? I mean, maybe, maybe, but I don't know. I I, I, I like Sonny Gray, but they also, you know, they also lost a lot of their rotation from last year too. So, you know, by design, this is by design, but I think that's a hell of an ask. That's a heavy lift. Um, the Cubs are basically the same team in their, in their, uh, you know, their metrics suggest that they didn't perform as well as their abilities. Does Craig Council make a difference? I don't know. I think Rossi got shafted, honestly. I, I, I don't think he was patently bad at managing anything. I, I thought he was just fine. Is Council the best manager in the game? Some people think so. How much difference will that make? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, they'll be in it. And, and again, the Reds have tons and tons of talent. They think they have enough depth now. They should be there. It's just a matter of who's going to step up and and, you know, uh, whether they're going to have too many young guys not be able to to sort of back up the talent just yet. We'll find out. But the, the Brewers, I don't know. They got a brand new manager and they, they don't have Corbin Burns. They might have the best starting pitcher in the division, Peralta. Right. Right. It, it, and again, the question is, is, is how much of a difference does that make for the Cubs and how much does that hurt the Brewers? Uh, that's, right. we're, right. that's the fun of getting ready for it. But I'll tell you, Gordon, I will never get used to this playing every other team because the Cubs do not face the Reds until the end of May, early June. And then of course they have, they face them twice in a week. I mean, that's, always, I don't understand why they do that. It makes no sense to me. I, I, Somebody's got to explain I, it. I, I don't know. It's, it's, I've given up a long time ago on trying to understand the schedule. Believe me, why why do we start? Why do we have so many openers in cold weather cities when you got warm weather cities and domes sitting empty the first first few days of the season? And how about this though, Gordon? We're talking about the Cubs and the Reds and and, and the dog fight. They finish the season in Chicago at Wrigley Field, three games, Cubs versus Reds. That again, I'm looking at that, and that may be a really important series for one or both teams. Hey, man, imagine if Imanaga is doing what the Cubs hope, uh, Montas is doing what the Reds hope, Hunter Green's healthy, Lodolo's healthy, uh, Kyle Hendricks is Kyle Hendricks, um, and Justin Steele is backing up what he did last year. What if that's your rotation with the division on the line in that last series? It, it's got me excited, Gordon. I'll tell you that. And I appreciate you jumping on here to talk and give us a little bit of, of depth and, and understanding of what's going on in Cincinnati. Can you tell our listeners, you you write for the Cincinnati Inquirer so they can find your articles there. Where can our listeners find you on Twitter? Uh, at G-Dub, like I just changed G-Dub Cub to G-Dub MLB. G Dub MLB. And so that's why I, that's where I always kind of peek there. And you had an interesting article the other day in the Cincinnati Inquirer about you asked about uh, Cody Bellinger returning to the Cubs and what that means to the Reds. They weren't sounding like they were too scared. Yeah, they basically shrugged when <laughs> they said, hey, it's the same team as last year. And I think we beat them in the season series. Um one of them said, I think Jonathan India said, we're, we're still the team to beat. And Spencer Steer said, cool. Let's go beat him with Joe, uh, Cody Bellinger. <laughs> They're well, young, and I got a feeling it's going to be a little bit chippy this year, Gordon. I got a feeling. I, I don't know. It might be, but I think that also speaks to these guys have that year under their belt and that and that sort of September fire of a playoff race under their belt. They feel pretty good about themselves, and I think a lot of the Cubs have a right to feel good about themselves too, but uh, it goes back to your dogfight theory. And, it's going to be a fun one. Cody talked about it today. A lot of those guys felt like they have some unfinished business. They, they, they felt that they should have been a playoff team and they, they let it slip and, and they're hungry to kind of show that they are a playoff team. So Gordon, I'm looking forward to this season, looking forward to having you back on in the end of May, early June. And, and like I said, hopefully see you at Wrigley and, and we'll, we'll have a drink or two and, and see where we are at that point. That sounds good, man. I especially like that idea of a drink or two. <laughs> Take care, bud. All right. You too. This is the Fly the W670 podcast, Cody Bellinger press conference, episode 18 
of season three. Don't forget to leave us one of those five star reviews and don't forget to listen, download and subscribe to the fly, the W podcast. All right, Crowley, Cody Bellinger is back. The reds are chirping quite a bit and the uh, Cubs are playing games on the field. Let's recap a couple of them. Yeah. On Monday, the Cubs versus the Royals Cubs lose six to nothing in the game. We saw the debut of both Seiya Suzuki and Michael Bush. Owen Casey got his first start of the spring in left field and Hayden Wesniski was on the bump for his audition for that fifth starter spot. Let's just say it didn't go well for Hayden with two outs in the bottom of the first when Snisky gave up back to back singles. And then Nick Prado took Wesniski deep to put the Cubs in a 3 0 hole. Council took him out of the game, put in Hunter Biggie with the and who got the final out. Now, remember, this is one of the quirks in spring training. In the second inning, Wesniski came back out. You can do that. And so it's just to prevent pitchers from going too long in one inning, throwing too many pitches in one inning. So Wesniski comes back out. He gets a strikeout before giving up back-to-back doubles. The Cubs were down 4 nothing, and Wesniski got one more out before Council pulled him for the second time in the game. Hayden finished the day going 1.1 innings, giving up six hits, four runs, one homer, and struck out one. Not great, Dustin. Um, the bullpen looked pretty good. Dick Lovelady and Bailey Horn both pitched scoreless innings again, but Bailey Horn now going to be doing that for the south side. One guy to keep an eye on, Dustin, is Luis Devers. Devers was a big part of the South Bend tw- Cubs 2020 championship team. He was named the Cubs minor league pitcher of the year, but he dealt with an is- wrist injury in 2023. He pitched a scoreless ninth with a walk and a strikeout, but he's a guy that, that when healthy, he could be a really good asset to the bullpen. Dustin, on the offense, the Cubs were shut out for a second straight game with only six hits, a lot of offers in the lineup. But in their debuts, Seiya Suzuki and Michael Bush both went one for two. Magical was one for three, and Jorge Alfaro was also one for three. That takes us to the game on Tuesday versus the Reds. And, Dustin, it was looking like more of the same offensively. Bleak, bleak, right? It looked like the Reds were chirping, and and it was was a reason they were chirping. The Cubs woke up, though, late in the game. Yes, Kyle Hendricks makes his spring debut, so he's going to be the first of what we already assume is going to be one of the starters to make his uh, first spring start. The rest has all been guys that we are looking at in that fifth starter spot. Uh, He gave up one run on one hit with one walk and one K. He also hit a batter. The hit was a triple to Will Benson, who had a really good game for the Reds. Benson, though, scored on a sack fly by former Cub and Crystal Lake native Nick Martini. But Dustin... When Martini hit the sack fly, I didn't think it was that deep, and I was surprised when the throw didn't go home, but maybe it's spring training. Hap wasn't going to go all out. I don't know, but I I, I didn't think it was. It wasn't definitely not that deep. I think Hap could have definitely made that throw at home. I don't know why he wouldn't, you know, practice it out in spring training. Yeah. Either way, the Cubs were down one nothing. Now, the interesting thing about the game, though, Dustin, is that we saw a lot of the relievers making their debuts that will make play important roles in the pen. First up was Adbert Alzlai, who we last saw pitching at the beginning of September before he was injured. And so this is our first time seeing him back. He pitched a scoreless inning and had 1K, Dustin. His Vila was up there with a fastball up at 95 to 96. Yeah, and that you like to see. But here's I have a question about this one. Okay. So why, why is he pitching that early in the game? Um, If you're going to tell me, if you're going to tell me though, here's the thing. If you're going to tell me when we get to the regular season, that a guy has to be in a certain inning and a certain situation and a this and a that and a this and a that, then shouldn't that be what we're mocking up in spring training? Why is he the first guy in? He's got a, he's got a dinner date. He's got a golf game to get to. He's got a side session. I, that, I I don't that, I don't understand that. It'd be a good question to ask Tommy how to be on Molly. It would Hall, be, wouldn't but, it? Wouldn't it be I, a good question? I would say if you were asking me, I would say that you want him to face kind of some of the better players that are in okay. early in the game good as opposed answer. to going to the ninth I did inning. Think, and, I, I did think about that when maybe the 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 quote unquote guys less likely to make the forty man are in the game. That's number, a good answer. <laughs> That's probably the answer they would give. But still. I am told that in the real, when it matters, these guys have to pitch in these exact situations that they're trained to do. They can't just be, they Crowley, they can't just be given the ball, go to the mound and get people out. So, okay, which one is it? 
Yeah, I think in spring training, it's all a little, like I said, with all, you know, you can come into a game, come out of a game, all that craziness. I don't think it matters as much. And there's obviously the adrenaline's not there as much as well. You want to just, you know, maybe work on some pitches, get your arm ramped up. I think that's more Bottom of a thing. Bottom line, so. though, he looked good when he was out there, and that's all that matters. Another guy that looked good when he was out there, Julian Merriweather came in the next inning, scoreless inning, no strikeouts, but that fastball was pumping in at 96-97. So Merriweather still bringing the heat. Next up came Carl Edwards Jr. making his return for the Cubs, trying to make this team as a non-roster invitee. He had a 1-2-3 inning with no strikeouts or walks. It was only a seven-pitch inning for CJ, but the Reds did make some hard contact. His fastball, 89-92. to um, we'll, we'll see how that all plays out. But Dustin, to me, the most impressive performance of the day was Jose Quas. He pitched a scoreless inning with two strikeouts and no walks. The fastball and slider were both working, and he made some of the red hitters look foolish. You know when a guy tries to jump out of the way and all of a sudden the ball's like right in the middle of the strike zone? Oh, yeah. it makes It's like when I was in Little League thinking I was going <laughs> to get hit by the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to me, I thought Quas looked really good, so hopefully that continues. Now, as good as Alzali, Merriweather, and Quas looked, Mark Leiter Jr. struggled in one inning of work in the seventh. Um, it was only a one nothing game in the seventh. Leiter gave up two runs on two hits, walked one, and struck out one batter. Dustin, we talked about spring training. Guys are working on things. But one thing that I went back and took a look at, he only threw two splitters, Dustin, which is his bread and butter pitch. And Leiter struggled in September, but the splitter is the pitch that got him on the team and made him such a valuable member of the bullpen. If that splitter is not working, which it wasn't in September last season, that's going to be an issue. So just, I want to see next time Leiter comes in, how many, how many splitters is he throwing and is he throwing them for strikes? Cause neither of them were for strikes either. No. It, yeah. Again, I, I get all that. You know, I, I try not to get wound up about the pitching and, and maybe not get wound up about the effort. We talked about Ian Happ a few minutes ago, um, but it just, you know me. Yep. non roster invitee Sam McWilliams also struggled in his inning of work. He gave up three runs on three hits, one strikeout, one qu- one K. He throws hard 95 to 97, but that fastball wasn't fooling anybody in, and the other pitches that he was throwing were just getting absolutely crushed. So the Cubs offense, Dustin, had been struggling as they were shut out in the previous uh, two games. And this game, it was looking even worse. They, they didn't get their first base runner until the fourth when Dansby Swanson drew a walk. They didn't get their first hit until PCA hit a leadoff double in the seventh. And the Cubs stranded him there. So the Cubs are down six to nothing going into the eighth inning, but the youngsters make a comeback. And the thing I love about this, Dustin, and you're, we're going to talk about it today with the Milwaukee game, the guys, Brennan Davis, Bryce Windham, Luis Vasquez, they load the bases for James Triantos, who hits a two out, two run single to make it a six, two game. Christian Franklin walked a little the bases, but PCA hits a hard liner. The Reds were able to turn it into a double play. But with two outs and runners at the corner, Matt Shaw, the youngster, hits a two-run triple, and the Cubs were down 6-4 before the inning ended. Then in the ninth, Brennan Davis hit a leadoff double, followed by a Bryce Windham single to put runners at the corners and no outs. Luis Vasquez hit a sack fly to make it 6-5. James Triantos flies out. Christian Franklin hits a two-out RBI single to make it 6-5, and PCA doubled to tie the game. Unfortunately, with runners at second and third, Matt Shaw struck out to end the game. Ends in a 6-6 tie. Fly the T. But uh, you know what? I love those names that we're reading off because these youngsters, I've seen them do it, Dustin, at the minor league level. They don't quit. They fight. Good at bats. Good approaches with two strikes. Just seeing a lot of things, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I love that they battled back. I hate that they play to a, a tie. I'd hate to be at a game that I actually paid real money for and it ends in a tie, but I get it. Yeah. And so at this point, you know, it kind of takes us to today. The Cubs take on the Brewers. Jordan Wicks gets his second start of the offseason. And I thought he looked better this time out. You know, he went three innings, gave up four hits and that's good. That's good. That's, that's, that's different in a preseason. I mean, that, that's a pretty, it's a pretty lengthy start for a preseason game. Right now, the first inning, he gives up a single and then there's an error on Matt Shaw, but Alex, that's what I'm talking about. See, this is now we're going, this is what I'm talking about, about first base. I'm, I'm got, I got a bad stomach about first base. Now that it sounds like Cody Bellinger is going to be the uh, full-time center fielder. 
Well, Shaw's was there, just in there for a second. You know what I mean? So, or Shaw's not going to start the the year at, with the big league club. I know, so, but just in general, I'm just saying, like, you're it nervous. Gives me, yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm just saying the error at first base. I just heard error at first base. It set off an alarm. Yeah, the, the error was charged to Shaw. So they had runners at, at first and second, and then Jack Bauer singles. But Alexander Canario throws him out at the plate. What a bullet. This kid's just got such an arm. Canario, like I said, he's going to make the Cubs have to make a difficult decision. And so because of that, they were able to get out of the inning without giving up any runs. Now, what you're going to then end up seeing with the Cubs is once again, Dustin, they're, they're, they're going to get score in the fourth inning, and it's going to be a two-to-one game right? Alexander Canario is going to single in the fourth to make it a two to one game. So not only did he throw a runner out, he had an RBI single, but, but will uh, Wilson Contreras, his brother, William hit an RBI double to make it two to one. But then in the sixth inning, just like the last game, Dustin, all the young kids just came, all the young kids just started driving in runs. And it's again, all of the names that I think are really going to play a huge role. Oh, in case he had a single Matt Shaw drew a walk, but one of the big plays Dustin is that Nick magical lead, led off the inning with a single and then Canario lined out for the first out, but Pete Crow Armstrong grounded into what looked like would be a double play, but with his speed, he beat it. So now you got two outs and Armstrong at second, he st- or at first, he steals second Matt Shaw walks and then own Casey lines in, uh, RBI single to make it three to one. Ali, Pablo Aliendo, my guy, doubled to make it four to one. Luis Vasquez singled and that made it six to one. So once again, guys that people like me who have been following in the minor leagues and have been hearing about for all this time, really making some noise. Luis Vasquez, Pablo Aliendo, Owen Casey, Matt Shaw, PCA, Canario. These are guys that I've been waiting for. And I know it's just spring training, but the fact that they're, you know, hitting well and, and, and making some really good plays, Dustin, I think is really, really beneficial. And and I love having this competition. No, absolutely. And this is also part of the reason why they weren't giving five, six, seven or more years to Cody Bellinger. Right. So Dustin, we're looking here now up, uh, up into, we got a full slate of games next week. The, the Cubs are going to take on the Rockies uh, followed by the White Sox and home on Thursday and Friday. They traveled to Glendale on Saturday to take on Otani and the Dodgers. And then on Sunday, they are back at Sloan to take on the Guardians. Well, we'll be uh, watching. We'll be listening. Uh, can't wait to get back and uh, uh, start grinding it out. Can't wait to see Cody Bellinger in the uh, Cubs uh, lineup. It'll be interesting to see where Craig Council pencils him in Crowley. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Of course, we're on all the social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Fly the W670, and you can email us, fly the W670 at gmail.com. And you can watch us, that's right, watch Crowley and I do the show on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy the weekend, enjoy the games, and if something crazy happens, if we got some uh, Scott Boris-type situations, we'll be back right here to uh, update everybody. And we told you, let Jed cook. Go Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!